Good evening. Welcome everybody to this event with Professor Olivette Otele in conversation about her new recently released book that I think you can see backwards, African Europeans and Untold History. This event is brought to you by the Festival of Ideas online. I should also stress that this is a co-production with the Bristol Old Vic as part of their Black History Month events. You can find a link to the Old Vic's full Black History Month listings in the chat. It has just come up there. And I would encourage you to have a click and see which other events are going on. It looks like an amazing program. The Festival of Ideas Autumn program has moved online this year, but will still feature writers and thinkers from all over the world. You can sign up to the e-newsletter via our website and you can follow us on Twitter so you can stay up to date with the latest events added. This event will be available to watch again via Crowdcast and also on our YouTube channel. We're delighted to be joined tonight as well by Omoyele Thomas, who you can see on your screen and who is providing us with British Sign Language interpretation for this event. So my name is Madhu Krishnan, and I am Professor of, World, of African World and Comparative Literatures in the Department of English at the University of Bristol. I'm also current director of the Center for Black Humanities. So I have the great pleasure of being colleagues with Professor Otele. I don't think Olivet needs a great introduction. We all know who she is, but I'm going to do a brief one anyway. Olivet Atele is Professor of the History of Slavery at the University of Bristol and Vice President of the Royal Historical Society. She is an expert on the history of people of African descent and the links between memory, geopolitics, and the legacies of French and British colonialism. It's an absolute delight to be in conversation with her today about her wonderful groundbreaking and agenda setting new book. While we're talking, I would encourage you in the audience to feel free to avail yourself of the chat feature where you can say hello and interact with other audience members. You can also submit a question for Olivet using the ask a question button, which you should see directly underneath your video feed. Just so you know the format of this event, Olivet and I will have a conversation for about 40 or so minutes, possibly less, and then we will open up to the audience for questions. But I would encourage you if questions occur to you as we're talking or having our discussion to please put them up straight away because we might be able to get to them sooner or integrate them into our conversation. We want this to be an inclusive and interactive event because we've all been stuck in our houses for seven months now and we need that bit of contact. So Olivet, thanks so much for joining us this evening. I know your schedule is incredibly hectic at the moment. We really appreciate your taking the time for this. It's a pleasure, it's such a pleasure to be here. <laughs> I wanted to start by asking you what might be perhaps quite a basic question, but one which you do discuss at some length in the book, which is your use of the term African European to describe the individuals and the histories that you're talking about. And I'm, I'm specifically interested in, in how you position that term and why you choose to use that rather than, for instance, Afropean as Johnny Pitts does or Afro-European or European African or so on and so forth. Oh, so many reasons. That's, that's, it, it might be a basic question, but it's the one that started the book um, because I was trying to grapple with certain things. Um, the first one being how we define ourselves, um, but within that, how we define ourselves, there's the uh, other people defining us and that influence how we see ourselves and therefore how we present ourselves. So, um, you know, African Europeans are defined by their color most of the time. Uh, so I thought, oh, I'm going to go that way. And then I thought, no, because when you're an African European, you don't see that boundary as set. It's very fluid. You're, you're European when you go to Africa and you're an African when you're in Europe. Um, so I decided to do this that way. And it's also um, a kind of a, a nudge or a, a, a wink uh, 
to African Americans because they found a way to define themselves through that term. And for me, that's very important because, it, you know, they went through um, a thought process that we too need to do, actually. Well, that I did in, in my, uh, my own life. And then I decided that it's going to be African Europeans because it makes sense to me. What's interesting, though, is that there's tremendous diversity in the kinds of identities, positionalities and experiences that you recount in this particular book. So I was wondering how you navigated that level of heterogeneity and diversity. I mean, in the book, you talk about people who are dual heritage. You talk about people who are migrants. You talk about second generation migrants. You talk about, quite importantly, in fact, following from what you said, North Africans, as well as Sub-Saharan Africans, so people of different phenotypical racial yes. identifications. So I'm curious about how you approach that, because there's so much complexity there. Yes, how I approach it was through a timeline which is historical. So I wanted to start with, um, with Romans, because I find it interesting how people are fascinated by Romans as the birth of civilization. The Greek and the Roman. So I thought, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to have a look at this. Let's start there. And the other thing is, um, throughout the uh, the book, the 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 thread, one of the most important threads for me is survival and adaptation. How you adapt to different environments and how that that um, you know that that survival, those survival techniques are at play depending on the environment, but also depending on um, people's view, people's views at the time and how these views changed. I wouldn't say evolved, they just changed. Um, yeah. and so that's the thread that I wanted to, to weave into that. And, and so, so there are many people, many different people, but actually um, it made, again, it made sense to me to follow that, that chronology and that uh, thread as well. Yeah, and it's something that comes through in the book, um, particularly in the way you handle the different terms that are used to position these people over time and the shifting ideologies that are kind of implied. Yeah. And I was sort of, again, wondering about that, that journey because what it showed to me in reading it is how drastically the, the positioning of different peoples of African European descent have been over history. I mean, you begin in the third century and you come to the present day. Yes, yes. It's it's to do with, um, you know, I talk a lot in the book about racism and I show that, you know, um, the relationship between the, the between those African Europeans and Europeans shifted because of the way both groups defined, but mostly Europeans defined color or saw color or wanted to represent color. So, um, so the shift also, you know, the... Uh, the thread is also about this, but I also wanted to show people who are somehow somewhere in control of certain things within that that very close knit environment. There's some agency that I wanted to show, and it was hard for me to sometimes actually I struggle to see how this was a form of agency. Um, and then I remember, you know, I've, I've read many people throughout, you know, while writing this book. I remember how. Even agency changes across time. What I see as nothing was actually a big deal for some people at the time. And I'm thinking about Juan Latino um, or Capitan or people who were considered to be, you know, flirting or completely be embedded with a system. And um, in, in, in 21st century or 20th century, they would be seen as collaborators, uh, sell out or whatever name we give these people. But Given their environment, managing to do this was incredibly, incredibly difficult and actually clever in many ways. I thought. Yeah, it's it's something that for me, I thought was very powerful that the book does, because if we look at kind of um, mainstream histories of African peoples or African societies, there's this kind of I almost want to say like myth of passivity, that that people of African origin simply accepted what was done to them and they were just victims. You know, we call it in academia, the deficit model, 
And one of the things your book does, as you say, is, is write against that by showing how different individuals worked within structures which are often oppressive, often violent, but they work within them. They navigate and they negotiate identities and social positions. And they're not always successful, but they're still doing it. Yeah. And I thought that was something really important. And I kind of, I was curious, you know, of how you might connect that to the way in which history and reporting is happening around us today. Uh, I see a, a immediate connection. In fact, while writing this, I kept thinking that we have different models. We have the conversation uh, many are having within the Black community about, you know, um, putting our own things together, um, setting our own schools and doing our own things. And I believe in those things as well. I believe, you know, African-Americans did that quite successfully. But um, at this point in time in history, there's not just the critical mass, but there's no means to do that. You have to have a certain power, um, certain means, financial means to be able to do certain things. Um, um, so I also think that there's this idea that collaborations, um, you know, this whole debate about allyship being, being a problematic. And I thought that it would be interesting to look at the book from that point of view as well, because allyship, as it has been called, can be problematic, but in many instances, uh, those African Europeans would not have survived without that. Mm -hmm. And they knew very well how to use it. And they knew very well that there were limits to it. So in, in, in my opinion, we also have to be aware of this. There are limits to everything. So my, my stance is, while it works, that's fine. If it stops working, if, for example, an ally stops uh, being an ally, then, then it's OK, too. There are many other things that can be done to carry on the, uh, the causes and, and, and to, to protect um, members of, of um, our communities and elsewhere. So, yeah, that's also, I didn't want to put it forcefully in the book, but it's really something that is very important to me. Um, yeah. One of the things I was really interested of um, that you set out quite early in the book are the kind of perils and pitfalls of the sort of history which looks at the exceptional individual. And I thought it was something that you handle very sensitively in the book. But one of the things I was curious about was um, the kind of history of exceptionalism in the way African societies have been interpreted or are represented and how you yourself went about choosing really who were going to be the figures around which you construct the much longer multi-millennia narrative that you do. Yeah, it's, it's another thing that I, I, I really sat down with myself and thought carefully about this because my initial thought was I, I resent the exceptional uh, the exceptional is the history of, you know, big men, uh, grand men, and a few women. You know, so, so I resent that kind of history. I'm, I'm, I'm more in tune with the history from below. I've always been that way. So, but how do you tell a story where um, those people were not written? You can't find documents about them. You know they were there because they influenced certain things, but you don't have access to certain life stories because you know the diaries are not there, and also so. And you know they they're there because oral history works too. Um, so I had to go back to the exceptional, but I had to make sure that people understand that the exceptional is not just used to tell the story of those who were fantastic and all the rest of it. It's you know it's double-edged sword because it also means that. You're presenting communities, um, for example, you're presenting people of African descent as some of them being exceptional with the assumption that the rest of them are not worth it because they're not, uh, they, you know, they're representative of the whole community. Those exceptional are not representative. They're just the exceptional ones who are deemed worthy enough to, um, to work and live alongside white Europeans. And, and I resent that idea, but I had to use them as well to, and therefore try and see now, somewhere in their story, their environment actually 
um, reveals some of the struggles. Um, yeah, make them less of uh, you know those models, but more of very subtle people who were perhaps in tune, some of them, with their own communities. Some weren't, but some were actually, or at least were in tune with um, the discrimination, discriminatory practices that were actually taking place at the time in a subtle way in certain settings. Um, class played a, a big role in that. You know. So were there figures where you found quite a lot of material to, to consider that you decided ultimately not to include? Yeah, there were people I just thought, um, you know, Equiano has been vastly studied. And it's somebody I taught many, many years ago, at least 10 years ago. But what, what has always interested me in Equiano was not so much him as a public figure, but his speeches to the parliament, you know, the political side of it that is rarely shown, what we see is as an example, but you don't go into details. And I thought, you know, even if I put that side of him, people will go back automatically to, um, to referencing him. In fact, he would take over the whole conversation about this book. And I didn't, I really didn't want that. Phyllis Whitley as well. These are women I admire greatly. Uh, but they've been written about um, quite vastly. And, and more importantly, they had much more agency than the rest of people I'm trying to, to present. Something that leads from what you're saying that I, I really wanted to hear more about was your research process for this book. Um, because quite often, African histories as are pre presented to us come in a truncated form where they begin with the colonial intrusion. And, you know, before that is apparently nothing. And you go much further back, you go to the third century. And I was curious about how then, as you kind of alluded to, you engaged with research in an area that is so rife with gaps and in certain ways, seems as if it's almost been constructed to perpetuate those gaps. Well, I completely agree. It has been constructed that way because there's the narrative of um, certain places and stories being the birth of history, you know, Greece, Rome, and all that. And um, I really, again, I really have to, I had to, to restrain myself not to go into certain periods naturally I would have gone to colonial era because that's my era of research. I started as 18th century um, historian. But at the same time, something that always got on my nerve is when uh, people teaching that history don't start with something else as if slavery just happened and this is the mechanisms. They were kingdoms before the arrival of Europeans. I keep saying this, it seems obvious, not tribes, because people keep saying, oh, the tribes. No, they were actually kingdoms before the arrival of Europeans. And this is the part where that I didn't put in the book that much, because I thought that I'm going to look at the narrow area, which is people who traveled up north or who interacted with Europeans. But it's something I wanted to talk about so very much. I would love to write a whole book about this so very much. So I had to you know, restrain myself, look at that. But also, even if I didn't want to, also uh, delve into the colonial because, because of the fact that 21st century, um, the legacies of the past are immensely important in 21st century uh, Europe or societies, global north and global south, actually. So I wanted to, I had to go back to that, you know, resistance to do it, but at the same time, I had to, to thread it into that whole narrative mm -hmm. because otherwise we, we, we are reproducing what is happening at the moment, the disconnect between what's happening now and people say, oh, but it happened 300 years ago as if there was no link whatsoever with that past. And yeah. And I wondered what kinds of material were you drawing on? Because again, so much of what you're talking about is, I mean, it's in the book title, an untold history or a history that we're not allowed to hear or we're not allowed to tell. So, you know, it seems to me like you must have had to go beyond the kind of um, standard methods. Um, yes and no. So just to, to explain this kind of story you're not allowed to, actually some of the stories are known. 
But what is interesting, what was interesting for me is that being a European, some stories are very well known by Italians, uh, Medici and all that, uh, by the French, but these are not known by the British. And I had constantly had to navigate because I was having this conversation and, and by the Germans. I was having these conversations with families in all these countries and, and seeing what they know and what they don't know. So it's become an untold history depending on where you're, you're based and which story we're talking about. Um, in terms of the material, it's a lot um, secondary uh, material in terms of what the history historians call sec secondary uh, material, but which is basically books about these people. But at the same time, it was deliberate because I, it's 220 20 centuries of research that I can't do, <laughs> that I definitely can't do. So it was important for me to use that material, but also to restrain myself not to go too much into the archives because this is my very first trade book. And the rule is you put some archival material, but the story needs to, you mm. know, needs to flow with. So I had to remove a huge amount of footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a huge amount of, well, primary source. I had to remove, basically. And it, it, it's an incredibly difficult exercise. So mm -hmm. it's a skill that I have been learning by writing this book. Some of the material that I found for, for Rome, it, it's, you know, it's, it's based on um, Strabo, for example, a uh, Roman historian. Um, and, um, and that material is available. So I had to go back to his account and it was fascinating. Again, I had to cut down a few things. because You learn so much about the society, the society's response and the society, um, the Roman society's um, outlook on the other, what we call today the other, the Egyptian, the Meroe. The, it's incredibly difficult um, to translate into, into uh, into a, a, a small book, but this deserves a whole study because the racial, not racial, because you would, the visible different, the visibly different other is tackled in such a complex way that it's fascinating. I had to, yeah, I had mm -hmm. to do this. Um, it's, it's funny that you say you took out a lot of that archival and primary research though, because I think it does still feel like it's there, not in the sense of being a dense academic book, because I think the book is very much something anybody could read and get a lot out of, but more in the kind of richness of the story, the kind of texture of the story. So I think that's something that was really interesting for me in reading it, that kind of- well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you mentioned um, Medici, and of course there, there are these other figures that are known, um, Pushkin being one that I think a lot of people would have heard about. and. I'm very curious about, because I've noticed in recent years that there are sort of periodically these lists that go around the internet that are like 10 oh. significant historical individuals that you didn't know were African. And, you know, you see names like this, you see a lot of speculation. And I'm curious about your thoughts on, on the kind of erasure and minimization of the racial identities and histories of these people. Oh, I think it speaks directly to racial anxiety. The anxiety of having people who were so um, well known, so accomplished, being uh, being of African descent, troubles the kind of narrative that many people have been taught. So even if people don't want to hide that history, it troubled them so much that they would rather not talk about it. And I think that these lists, um, I used to think these lists were really annoying because you know, you're working on this and you know about this. But I realized that for, for younger generation, not younger than our students actually, um, you know, secondary um, school uh, uh, students, even primary school students, they like to see these people. They like to know about those stories. And I have been having these conversations with uh, family members and, and my my own children, they love these stories. And that certainly I realized that actually, I shouldn't dismiss it. Uh, I'm thinking at a kind of a, a higher education intellectual level, but this is an emotional connection that people do with stories. And they are important too, I think. I think another thing that you discuss in the book that 
is one of those things where, again, um, for those of us who are in kind of academic circles, you're kind of like, yeah, yeah, I knew that, but actually people don't think about it, um, is the, the historicization of race and kind of otherness, as you term it, over history, and particularly the kind of concept that race was an emergent construct during this period in which national identities were consolidated. Mm. And I was wondering if you could say something about that. Yes, we tend to think that it's a new thing. It's something that is continuous and it has, it has been shifted. Well, shifted dramatically, of course, in the 18th century, the era of um, colonization, 18th and 19th century, but also 17th century, actually. 18th, 19th century, it shifted a lot because there was this, this an ease of Europeans about a trade that was actually based on, on the subjugation of human beings. So you need to justify that by various means, religion, economic success, and all the rest of it. But you also needed to construct a, a national narrative that was accepted by a great number. So we go back to the idea of a collective memory that is a work of consensus that is accepted by most people. How do you do that? You do that by dehumanizing that other in a way that is acceptable and subtle. So um, you suddenly decide that, um, for example, in the 20th century, people think that the, um, the dehumanization started in the 20th century. Well, actually it started slowly, insidiously throughout, and it's woven th within a narrative of hierarchy. So for me, it was important to look at these, the way it was done um, through language, through the use of the terms, how you define a black person um, throughout the centuries, and but also how historians themselves had participated in that process by reinventing the kind of the history of, for example, American plantation by putting it as the start of everything. Whereas actually this is an intellectual exercise that came after, um, after the subjugation. Um, I'm not sure I'm answering your question because I'm going on um, my brain. No, you now. are. You are. I think you definitely answered it. And it, it leads into um, another question that I was going to ask, which is one of the other things that you discuss across the book is, is how this leads to the formation of certain taxonomies and classifications that produce these hierarchies and modes of domination. And I was really interested in hearing a bit more about that. So are you thinking about um, paternalism and... Mm -hmm. um, that, so, so it became obvious for many that to, to, to try and, and posit Europeans, white Europeans as superior, you, need to, you needed to have certain categories, but those categories were not sufficient. They, need to be, they needed to be backed up by um, lived experiences. And lived experiences basically was about the way certain people, when you interact with them, reacted to that interaction. So I'm going to give you an example. Many people uh, talked about paternalism as a step, one of the uh, taximonies. So paternalism is to the idea that um, Africans can better themselves or you know, they can become better as good as well as intelligent and all the rest of it as Europeans if you provide them with an education. So you're behaving as a white planter, for example, as a, a father, paternal, who is going to provide certain things, but you shouldn't go too far and too, too, um, too fast by doing that. So I'm going to give you another example. William Wilberforce, for example, was, as we all know, an abolitionist. But he was very much a figure of paternalism because he believed that Africans um, should be set free, but not immediately because they needed to pre be prepared for freedom. They were not, they were like big children. Um, wh whereas other people thought that this is ridiculous, you know, just, just set them free. And, and mostly women actually in the 19th century. So, and, uh, and there are other people who believe that no matter what you do, they will never reach that level. Even when you educate them, they become the, the best, the best they can achieve is being parrot and regurgitating whatever you teach them, but they don't have the, the intellectual and mental capacities to actually thought by, think by themselves. And in that sense, they're a bit like beasts. 
you know, and if they're, they're like based, they need to be contained, controlled, policed, um, away, preferably from Europe. But if you really can't do otherwise, you make sure that there are laws in place to contain them. So mm -hmm. now we're moving into the racial hierarchy the, and profiling that we know in the 21st century. So it's, there's a long history to that, um, actually. Mm -hmm. So each stage has got its own um, thought process and it's been carefully thought about. It's, these are no, no accident. It's been intellectualized. It's been, um, yeah, it, it's not an accident. People have been thinking about it and how to, and therefore the way people of African descent were treated in certain contexts, depending on these uh, worked uh, according to these, um, to these patterns, if you would, and thought processes. There's also a lot in the book about how, you know, identity markers like religion or like class intersect. Um, yeah. For instance, I was quite struck with, I think um, it was in the chapter about the Ga women, it may have been the Signares, when you talk about kind of lower class down on their luck European men actually seeking out marriages with these women who were in the sort of intermediary class and quite wealthy and powerful. So yeah. I thought that was interesting as well. So it's, it's again, it's not this simple binary. No, it's never. These women are fascinating uh, because um, for those who, 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 who don't know about this, so, so the, the Ga women or the Sinya women, because Ga women were economically perhaps less um, mm -hmm. wealthy and they were a small, much smaller group. But the Sinya women were in Senegal and um, Saint Louis, um, the island of Saint Louis and Gore. And these women were the children of uh, Europeans and, and, and African, black African women. And they became a, a category uh, of intermediaries, but a, a, a very powerful category, actually, because they were involved in all sorts of trades. So they were slave traders. They were uh, gold traders. They became rubber traders. Um, they became fashion icon because they would order some fabric from Europe and then uh, the fabric coming sometimes from Asia. So they were really the examples of empire consumption, if you would. Uh, French and British Empire. And they were also uh, women who were, they became so wealthy at some point that they were able to set certain terms. In other words, they wanted to stay connected to Europe, so they kept on marrying those Europeans. Uh, and in the 19th century, even when uh, the law forbid them to be, um, to inherit the wealth of their father, as the white father, um, they decided that they, they were still going to marry Europeans. And the, you, so you see a, a bunch of, well, a, a, a sizable number of poor European white men going to Africa, going to Senegal, trying to marry these wealthy heiress. And um, yeah, that's the story of, uh, of the senior women. And they reinvented themselves after all this because... Um, they, most of them lost their wealth, but not their, their power because political power remained in some ways. Um, and they became healers, you know, reinventing themselves in the end of 19th century. Another thing that um, I really enjoyed reading about um, in the book was the way you discuss how these kinds of um, racialized ways of thinking or viewing the world persist even in situations where there's an apparent refusal to perceive race. So you talk about, for instance, color, color blindness in Sweden. Um, you talk about laicite and assimilation in France. And mm. I thought that was something else kind of, that felt really relevant to the present day in various ways. Yeah, it does. I mean, this obsession with not seeing color is, as we know, uh, systematic of something deeper, something again racial anxiety. So you see it in Sweden. You see it in in the Netherlands, where uh, in the Netherlands not so much because it's 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 much more vocalized. But in the Nordic countries, it's it's like um, a faux pas. It's it's something that is a big no no. And yet, all the whole society is racialized. We we go on the assumption that white is the default. And therefore, everything should uh, fit into that model, um, which makes it very hard to talk about racial inequality and even harder to fight against um, against racism. Uh, 
and it's so ingrained that it's not just um, you know politicians. It can be even uh, African Europeans or Afro Sudish as well. As I give the example of the uh, the mutilated um, work of art that I talk about, you know, it's 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 um, it's internalized, and therefore, you know, uh, the idea that you can mock race in a way, um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's troubling. It's troubling. Yeah. 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 So I have um kind of one, maybe two more questions, but I do really want to give the audience a chance to ask their questions. I can see that we have one already, which is great. But please don't be shy if you're at home listening. You know, please do feel free to pose your questions because that's what we're here for. Um so I, I wanted to ask you if, if there were any particular stories in the book that felt particularly important to you or that 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 um, you kind of clicked with in any specific way. Oh, yeah, there are many stories. You know, I have I have a soft spot for every single character, even the nasty ones. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it's, it was hard to let them go, actually. Um, I would say the story I would connect the most is probably the German side, the German because it's a family story. It's 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 about yeah about my my ancestors, um, and I would hope that the book will be translated into German at some point. Um, but the other bit was the twenty first century. You know, I remember a few years back somebody asking me, which, if you had to choose which period you'd like to live. 21st century. I'm a black woman. This is where I think uh, I'm, I'm at ease and, and freer to express certain things. Um, and it's also about the 21st century black women resilience and fight and collaborations with various communities that I wanted to talk about. And I feel passionate about it because this is Bristol. This is the story of Bristol in the 21st century, a city that is, is um, active, passionate, vibrant. And, 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 and yeah, and I, again, I had to restrain myself to put too much Bristol in there because it's not representative of the whole country, isn't it? So, yeah. yeah. And um, how have, so you said earlier that this was your first trade book. How, how have you found it? How have you found the responses? How have you found the kind of whole experience? Uh, it was, oh, I'm so excited because um, I I got to, me to meet people who've been writing trade books for since forever. This is what they do. And talking with them and understanding their thought process was incredibly helpful. Um, the response so far has been great. I hope it's going to be, you know, translated into buying the book. <laughs> um, but so far it's been incredibly supportive um, yeah fingers crossed but as we say um, there's a good friend of um, a good friend of mine um, Professor Martha Jones um, who's, a, who's an American who says you write a book you it's your baby and then you have to release it let it go and it means that the criticism the goodness criticism you accept the goodness you thank people, but you have to let it go. So um, today, and the book is coming out tomorrow, but today I'm letting it go. It doesn't mean that I can't talk about it, but it means that the, the emotional attachment um, is going to have to go at that point. And for those of you in the audience who haven't gotten a copy yet, if you follow the green button at the bottom of your screen, you can buy a copy of the book from our friends at Waterstones. So I do want to turn right now to audience questions. And we have a question here from Elizabeth Bull asking, what is the difference between black history as a discipline and African Europeans history? As a di well, the discipline, black European history doesn't really exist as a discipline. It's just um, so far it's been like a subgenre. Uh, you know, that people can uh, um, look at. And quite often that history of black history, uh, black European history is so tied up, as you said earlier, into uh, colonial history that you, people don't see it as, um, as black history as such. And if they do, there's a confusion as to black equate slaves equate colonial. Well, it shouldn't be that way. 
So the difference with, um, sorry, with African history? Yeah, so black history versus African European history. Well, African European is a broad identity. Um, I would say black history is, um, is a political stand. Blackness is a political stance. I know there's a whole discussion about uh, political blackness, but blackness, uh, um, deciding to call oneself or accepting to be called black is a political stand. When, whereas when you talk about African Europeans, you talk about geographies. And within those geographies, race is embedded, the question of color is embedded. When it's black, it's about the racial categories and racialization. Um, that's, that's how I would, I, would, I would see it or explain it. And our next question is from Sarah Govan, who asks, you mentioned 20 centuries of history and the need to focus on secondary sources. Is there a topic or a location from this book that you really want to drill into the primary sources on? What's got you really excited for more research? Yes, um, several things. Again, the 20th, 20th century is important to me. Um, and that's the kind of history I actually do, which is the history and memories or legacies of the past. Um, so as, as a memory scholar, I look at how stories are, are constructed and how they construct national and local and communities narratives. So, and, and for that, you have material and the material is very present. It's people, people's testimonies, um, all sort of documents. So that's the kind of history, at the moment at least, um, that I'm very interested in. Another history that I would have liked to, but I think I, I would need a new career, um, is a kind of black Romans um, or black Greeks or, you know, that ancient history. But mm -hmm. it, it's going to take me a while to catch up. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Our next question asks, um, and it comes from someone who has um, put down intermission as their chosen name, and they have asked, do you think the demand and the space for Black European history is growing? Do you think England or Germany will integrate this into our education systems more soon? Oh, I would love to, and I hope they will. It's one of the reasons as well that I wrote this book is, is as a provocation, because it is doable. It's the kind of history that I have been teaching for two decades now. Um, in my classes. So it's doable, it's possible, and I would like to see it earlier in the curriculum. In other words, I would like to see it in the secondary school uh, so that by the time we get to university, we go even deeper, even further. Um, in, 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 in Germany or in England, I think we, we're getting there. You know, there's this, this move about from the Welsh Assembly to look at the, the curriculum, this, you know, integrating black history into the curriculum. Um, I don't know what's going to happen for England, but I know that it's definitely a move uh, going on uh, for Wales. Um, Germany is an interesting place, you know. Um, it's a back and forth discussion. We're still talking about the Herero. Um, we're still talking about genocide because there are some deep-seated um, wounds in there. So it's a kind of history that people will tend to focus on when they talk about black history. Whereas for me, black history is much broader. And so I hope that, for example, we will look at the colonial, but also at, at the interrelationship, at the relationship between um, post-colonial subject. And in fact, in Germany, there are so many, in Germany, in the state and elsewhere, there are many scholars who are looking at that, Afro-Germans, actually. Uh, so integrated into the, the curriculum, I know from my nephews and cousins that it's not the case. And it would be great if mm -hmm. it was the case, yeah. Our next question comes from Steph Gillett or Gillet, if my apologies if I'm mispronouncing it. Um, she says, good evening, Olivet. Will you find ways of going back to the primary sources and letting some of the archive you studied find a wider audience? If I would come back, go back, I don't know. If I'm writing a book on a specific topic, yeah, definitely. I need to go back to archive. This is my, this is what, how I function as, as, um, as a historian. I need to go back to archives. 
But there is a problem and there is a difficulty in making them, some of them accessible. Um, but that's my problem, I guess. I just need to, to make, to find a way to, to, to make mm -hmm. it happen. Um, yeah. I suppose that in a sense, you know, you're writing the book makes six accessible in a sort of intermediary way, if nothing else. Um, what, so this is from Katie who asks, what do you think it is about Bristol that makes it such an activist, passionate city? Hmm. <laughs> I would say the vibrancy, um, people have very strong opinions on each side and it, it, it's, it's a strength in a way, but it's also a weakness because it, it becomes at times hard to find consensus. And the, 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 and so difficult to find consensus, but at the same time, the debate is constantly pushed further. Because what's happening in Bristol, for example, with the Colston and with uh, the, the slave traders, is not particularly happening in many other places. So uh, everyone was surprised by you know, the, the toppling of the statue and all that. But we all know that the discussion has been going on for decades in Bristol. Whereas in other cities, it's early starting. We're only starting to see, or not, not, not about the history, but the challenges to that history and the ways in which um, uh, 21st century Britain has to reflect the demands of communities. So I think that what makes Bristol exceptional is the activist heart and soul of this city mm. and, and its people, uh, but also the ability to, to fight together. You know, it's a city mm. where you don't have, you know, cars being burned because people um, disagree. They find other ways to fight. And I, I kind of, I know it's mm. a bit weird, but I kind of like it those fights as well. <laughs> well, it's also something I was wondering about because you, in addition to your academic work, hold a number of, of civic positions. You're, you're quite involved in, in civic life. And I was just kind of curious about how that, that kind of public intellectual, civic intellectual position works for you. Ah, it's, uh, it's intense. <laughs> to say the least it's intense but it's also important for me I, I um earlier on I was talking and I was saying that I'm not I'm not just as if it's 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 quite enough but I'm a scholar but I'm also an activist I was an activist before being a scholar so I can't separate any of it it's part of my life and it's dangerous because sometimes there's no boundaries between life and work because I live what I what I work on um, but I don't see any other way to have an impact I see I see multiple multiple ways to have impacts um, and it's fine if somebody concentrate on, on 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 doing academic work as a scholarly activism I respect that and I think it's normal it's it's good but I can't help myself doing other stuff. And it's, it's very tiring and exhausting even. So I need somebody to stop me. <laughs> so returning to our audience questions, we have one from Tom Morris that is asking, in Britain, we are still struggling with the legacy of racist language and attitudes we invented and adopted to allow us to justify and continue the atrocities of enslavement. Our challenge is to overcome this. Is there a country elsewhere in Europe where there is a more inspiring history in relation to attitudes and language? Uh, I'm afraid not. That's the, that's, no, there isn't. It takes different forms, the racist attitude and you, the French, um, the French outlook on racism is it's it's much more direct. It's less perhaps flowery, um, but it's it's much more brutal and physically brutal. The Swedish evasion of anything to do with color is equally brutal because it means that if you're uh, racially abused, it's very hard to prove it and very hard to tackle it. So no, there is no country. Unfortunately, I think, and I have to say this: this is a disease. It's, it's a, a kind of um, common disease, if you would. And we know that it's, 
you know, leg these is these are part of the legacies of the past. And there's no one way to tackle it because it depends on the country and on their um, control, or, or rather their narrative on 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 race. You know, it's it's, it's, a, it's a sad answer, but yeah. Mm. Sad doesn't mean it's not true. Yeah. So. Our next question is from ST, who has asked, how do you navigate your positionality as an African European within a context where you can often be called black? As an African European, this is something that can be tricky to navigate because you are talking with European people who identify as black or who call all African people as black, who have been socialized into constant racialization. In a way, this also joins Chimamanda Adichie's point who was never black while in Nigeria, but became black when she put foot on U.S. soil. Yes, that's, this is our story. You can be offended by it, you can be saddened by it, but that's a reality. And I think it's a reality that at a very young age, we learn to accept and in some ways to use to tackle certain things. Um, I don't mind if somebody wants to call me black. If somebody calls me African Europeans, I'd be very surprised, but because it doesn't work that way. If somebody calls me Europeans, it's never happened, except in Brussels, <laughs> for, for, for specific reasons. Um, so, you know, you can take everything as a slur, because it could be, or you can see it as a vibrant term that offers possibility to tackle certain questions, uh, racism, inequalities, and, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, I, I choose to, to see it as an opportunity rather than an insult. And kind of related, we have a question from Kamar Scott asking, if black is primarily a political term, is it useful when we are talking about history? Isn't black history in Britain the same as British history? Interested to get your thoughts. I think that it is a political term, but that has a long history. So it's also related to historical um, historical premises and historical um, to ideology. So you know, it's also cultural because it's a cultural construct. It's many things. It's a social contra construct too. So it's many things. Is it useful? I don't think it is, but it has been functioning that way. So unless we come up with a different term that actually means more to people, then um, I'm happy to come, you know, to use another term. But I just wanted to say something about this, is that there are many people uh, of African descent who resent the term black and who refuse and who have accused me of, of you know, playing to the white master, whatever, um, other other uh, term by saying that you're using the term of the racist master. I answered to them that the racist master, whether I use the term or not, will be racist anyway. So let's 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 try and see how we come together, how we tackle these these fights, and how we tackle racial inequality, um, with or without a term. You know. Mm -hmm. I suppose there's an additional question there about um, what's the, the utility of something like Black history yeah. when Black is interior to British identity as well. Like, do you think that there's still a need for, for Black history, for instance? Well, the history of people of African descent, therefore Black history for many, in many cases, is not taught. So how do you say that history is not taught? Do you say the history of people of African descent is not taught? It's easier for many people to just say black history is not taught. Um, if it was taught and be completely integrated into British history, then we don't have a problem. Then we wouldn't even need to talk about it. It would be part, because it is part, an integral part of uh, British history, but it's not seen as such still. So mm -hmm. until it, you know, until it is, um, we still need to go through around that um, that mountain. I'm afraid, and mm -hmm. one day I suppose I hope it will be seen as. Um, this is actually my argument. It is part of European history. Mm -hmm. 
And we have one more question here from Ose Johnson. When we talk about African European history or African Europeans history, how useful do you see art in that conversation? I understand. Ah. I understand that art was used to normalize and fight slavery in the abolitionist movement. How effective do you think it would be in the modern day conversation? It's something that comes across in my book. I talk a lot about art and how it's been used to subjugate, to subjugate, to represent, to vilify, um, to exoticize black bodies, people of African descent, but also how art can be um, a way to tell a story that is um, in tune with what people feel and what they need. Art can transcend and um, help help overcome pain. So uh, for me, art is, I, I wouldn't say everything, but it's certainly close to everything. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly important. Mm -hmm. So we are in fact just about a out of time. Um, which is quite surprising, but the hour flew by. I did want to ask you before we let you go, um, if you had any thoughts or reflections you wanted to share with us on um, really what's been going on around the world these last few months. Um, I will say for those of you who don't yet have your copy of the book, it goes right up until summer 2020. So it's, it's very topical and timely, but you know, a lot has happened since then. So I was, I was curious about your thoughts around um, the current energies around Black Lives Matter and social justice in the second half of this year, how far that energy you see is kind of persisting or dissipating, and indeed the kind of global struggle for the dignity of Black lives. Um, for example, right now we see what's happening in Nigeria with the NSARS movement and the absolutely horrific scenes coming out of hideous brutality against young Nigerians. Um, so I was just curious about, yeah, what your kind of take on this, this moment in history is. Um, the world doesn't seem to be in great shape. And there seem to be despair and ugliness and, and, and pain and violence. And the remnants of colonial methods, Nigeria, um, but, you know, I can't, I can't not believe that there's a better way and there's a hope. I, I can't, mm -hmm. otherwise, what everything I'm doing is pointless. So I want to believe that, the, that there's hope and the hope, I, I see it every day. I, I feel it every day on social media, virtually because of COVID and all that. But even prior to that, the younger generation, um, my students' generation, my son's, my oldest son's generation, they do not put up with this. They don't accept things as people from my generation used to be. We know we're people of consensus. We're fighting, but we're always trying to find ways to accommodate. They don't. They go, boom, this has to go. We're demanding it because this is our planet. This is, this is who we are. So I, I have a lot of faith in them and a lot of hope in them. And it might not be again in my lifetime, but it doesn't matter. We all do our bit. It doesn't matter where it happens, but I just know it will happen. Um, yeah, I have, yeah, hope. Mm -hmm. And is there anything you'd want to say to that um, next generation of activist scholars? Yeah, I want to tell them that don't, don't believe for a second that because you don't see the result immediately, it's not happening. It takes generations for things to, to happen. And each one of us um, from all backgrounds, we're all standing on the shoulders of so many people um, and learning that history of activism is incredibly important and crucial because that gives you, again, a sense of hope. They did it so that we can talk about it today. So don't despair. We, we, we'll get there. <laughs> I think that's a lovely place to end it. An unusual moment of optimism in 2020. Um, thank you so much for your time tonight, Olivet. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you about your wonderful book. Um, again, if you've not yet ordered your copy in the chat, you can see a link to Waterstones who are currently offering 10% off. Um, it comes out tomorrow. So, you know, I definitely recommend it as a wonderful history of two millennia that I think anybody could learn quite a lot from.
Um, I'd also like to once again thank the Bristol Old Vic who are co-producing this event. Once more, it's part of the Bristol Old Vic Black History Month series. You can find a link to further events. Again, if you have not yet done so, please do sign up for the Festival of Ideas newsletter or follow us on Twitter. There's so many amazing events coming up in our autumn season. The Great Reset is coming up, the Festival of Economics. There are a range of amazing Black History events, um, many, many, many more things. Um, we may be online and in our houses, but there's still much to hear about and much to learn. Um, and finally, you know, I would just once again like to thank all of that for her time. I'd really like to thank Omoyele for the amazing interpretation this evening. It's been beautiful to see. <laughs> and I would just like to thank you and the audience for your questions um, and for spending a bit of your evening with us. Thanks again and good evening, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.